what really makes music valuable. You know, music as an art is valuable. And I know earlier they had a discussion about um, digital sales and this and that and streaming. And the reason that music, I feel, I've thought about this quite often, has lost value because it lost all tangibility. It's not real. You know, if you're buying a digital transferable copy, what is the worth in that? I mean, these records, you were saying they're memories, but every record you talked about was a memory. You remember where you bought it, you remember who you bought it. I was looking at my record collection the other day, and I was pulling out, sorry. I mean, that's why, that's why vinyl is back, you know, and, and when you think of a record like this, it's designed and illustrated by one of the band, you know, and I mean, I have records, I mean, Joy Division, uh, used to actually all come together in the factory office, which was in the front room of a house in West Didsbury in Manchester, and glue the sleeves together for their own records. I mean, I and, and when the Durutti column records came out, because Vinnie Riley was such a space cadet, Tony Wilson used to ask Joy Division to come in and glue his records together as well. So you're not just buying the music, you're buying a product that, that the band have invested time and emotion and energy and creativity into. It, exactly. It's kind of funny you said that, because I, when I first started, I, um, I was actually kind of like an assistant at, I mean, I, played, I made a record with Omar S. And uh, I would just go to his house and like help him out and stamp a lot of the Oasis, not the Oasis, but the Omar S records, because it's like a hand stamp. I was like a 17 year old kid, just like boop, ba doop, ba doop, ba doop, you know? But it's that process and it's about people coming together to put out something that's real and that's honest, you know? And so much of music and entertainment's based on what you said. Yeah, because when you talk about value, you know, because I, I was sat in, in this room this morning and, you know, and I was obviously, I was pleased to hear that the global dance music industry is now worth 1.7 billion pounds, it's dollars, insane. sorry. I mean, that is great because it's employment and it means there's lots of success and it means, you know, we're all doing something worthwhile. But at the same time, I thought, if the dance music industry was worth no dollars, how many of us would still be involved? I'd put my hand up, you exactly. put your hand up. And that is, that's the key thing, because we understand it is so much more. I'm not saying money doesn't matter, but it's so much more than that. And when you talk about value, it's, a, it's about you know, changing lives, it's about inspiring people, it's about bringing people together, it's about sharing experience, it's about feeling emotion. All those things that music does. That's 100% actually. It's funny you say that, because I've come to these IMS things and I've said some controversial things here and there. But, but it's because I care, you know, I, we both care. And the people, Ali, you know, people who do this forever, it's not the, just a job. It's an entire dedication to a culture, to an idea, to music, you know? Like Carl Cox was sitting up here moments ago, and he said, I do this every week. I continue to do this, not for myself, it's partially probably for him, but for, he said for clubbers, for the people to experience this culture and for him to let people continue to experience that culture. And the thing with vinyl, uh, with kind of trading cultures, you know, like Dave passing things down to me, like one day I hope to pass down to someone else or that us sharing these moments with you or these experience or these talks is about the preservation and archival of these ideas. And, you know, for people to really take in how much, how fortunate we are really to have lived these times and to be able to have, have the, these musical moments to treasure. Well, also, I think that as a, as a DJ, I think you're in a very privileged position because you, it's almost like the community have elected you to uh, once a week or whatever to play the music that somehow articulates how you and the community are feeling. And that's exactly, exactly what it was like in Manchester and always been like in Manchester. If you imagine Manchester in the late 1980s, it was pretty much of a shithole. Thatcher had destroyed the, the north of England's manufacturing industry. There was large scale unemployment. There wasn't much to do. We had a musical legacy thanks to Joy Division and, and we had a club thanks to New Order. So it was like we were there and we had 1,500 people in front of us and we, I felt like we were articulating a sense of uh, celebration uh, and a sense of kind of uh, potential um, and a kind of a fight back. And 
you know, and then I, I remember 10 years later DJing in a club called The Boardwalk, and by this time the Manchester thing had gone a little bit, um, you know, it'd gone bad, and we had gangsters, we had guns, we had killings, we had all that kind of stuff. And I, can, I was working in a club called The Boardwalk, and one Friday, every Friday I did this night in The Boardwalk called Yellow, and one Friday, uh, 500 people came. One Friday night, uh, everybody left the club, and the next day I read in the local paper that two people out of that 500 had been killed that weekend in Manchester. Um, and they were, you know, I mean, everyone is innocent who dies. No one deserves to die, but they were just kids, yeah. you know. Imagine the next Friday when I turn up to the club and that community of 500 people has gathered together knowing what I know, that two people are missing. And knowing those that people. is an amazing privilege for somebody to be put into that situation saying, Dave, articulate how we feel, articulate our sorrow, but also articulate the fact that we have hope and that we're not going to give and we up. We must go on. Yeah. That's it. I mean, oh, that's such a, like a really touching story. I mean, and it goes more into the idea that DJs are great musical curators. You know, it's not, and that I have talked about the difference of um, kind of, com let's say, commercialized DJing, EDM, whatever, and, and what, what we do, you know, and it's the difference between art and entertainment, you know, and as a musical curator, like an art curator, it's about providing an idea of how people feel or what that time reflects, and only through kind of actually studying people and studying music can you get to that point of gaining that knowledge. And it is an incredible opportunity. Like recently, I had um, the opportunity to close this really amazing club in, um, oh, where is it, Geneva? Or is it, no, Basel, sorry. Um, excuse me, uh, called Nordstern, you know? And it, the club was open for like, a, like 15, 16 years. It stayed open for three days to end. and. I remember at the closing of Trow, another club that I was uh, a part of, like at some point I was with a couple of the other DJs and we thought the last set, well it was supposed to be done by a different DJ and then someone else kind of filled in. And we were, I was pissed off actually. My last song was like a bit obvious and it was just like, what the fuck, you know? Like me and my friend, me and Tom Trago left and we were just like, we were like physically upset, you know? And it's comes great, you get great responsibility, you know, like a, a space will be closing. What will be the last record played at space in Ibiza? You know, what was your, one of your last records at the Hacienda? What was like, I mean, what I went at the, um, sorry, Nordstern, uh, I asked the owner, I was like, what do you think? What do you want the last thing today? And, and Prince had just died. And he's like, I want it to be Purple Rain. So we ended with Purple Rain, and it was a beautiful moment, you know? Also celebrating the passing of Prince. It was like boom, boom. It's one of the, the owner's favorite songs, one of my favorite songs of all time. And it's like, I, I think DJs need to take that into mind more often. You know, it's not about just you DJing and, and playing. You know, I have the opportunity to play every week here at DC10 and be with those people and try to play differently and excite them and try to excite their imaginations. But let them feel ways, because I know one thing that music's given me, I'm not a very emotional person. Like, I think, of, I think a lot, and, but I, I'm not very bad at expressing my emotion. I think men are generally pretty bad at this. But through music, I can find the feelings that I can't show or I can't express when I listen to these Marine Girls records or many other records from Dave's collection and stare at them and think of the times he listened to them. It adds emotion to your life and expression to your life. And that's something that people, I think, have lost through the digitization, digi digi I can't fucking say it, sorry, to d digitizing music, you know, and things just becoming this throwaway, you know, this throwaway culture we have today. I mean, I you're right, I think sometimes people don't realize how, you know, the DJs are playing other people's records, but you are communicating so much about yourself in what you play. Um, I mean, the last record I played at this club I talked about um, that I've been doing, for, I did for seven Boardwalk. years, Boardwalk. Yellow at the Boardwalk, the last tune I played there was Romanthony, Hold On, you know, and, and 
I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest, because I'm, I'm like in a bit of a, having sold all my records, I'm in a kind of a bit of a zen-like, honest <laughs> kind of stage in my life. Perfect. But, you know, sometimes people say to me, oh, you know, what, what, what are your most remembered experiences as a DJ? And I'm always like, well, there was the time I got a blowjob when I was DJing. While DJing? Yeah, while I was I've DJing. I've always wanted to do that. Uh, and, like and with a crowd in front of you? No, there's a mount, there's, there's, <laughs> I'll tell you the big problem with it, Seth. Before you get too excited and put it, add, add it to your list of things you want to do, <laughs> the big problem with it is you've got a tune playing, okay, and there's, you're getting a blowjob. It was off a girl. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're getting a blowjob, and you've got to mix the next record in, okay? So the thing in your head is, do I come before or after <laughs> I've mixed the next record in? That's incredible. Um, <laughs> The other, um, the other thing was having a gun pulled on me while I was DJing. Oh, wow. Which, um, That's actually one of my greatest fears. And the, but the other, the other one is what I was saying before, is I've actually cried. I put a record on and cried. Because like you, I'm like, you know, we young men, we don't show emotion. And so you've, you know, and maybe you don't say stuff to people. But, some, but there's been two occasions where, uh, where just the, the power of the music and, and the sense of the crackle in the atmosphere, in the club, and what this moment means to me has, no. has made me cry in a club. No, actually, actually I, I've had a few, few moments, although I, I very rarely cry. And uh, I remember, not last year, but the year before, a, a dear friend of, of many of uh, us in the community, uh, Darren Smart, had passed away. And... Um, he passed away on the weekend, and I had to play DC 10 at, on the Monday, which was like, there were some friends there, and we were all in this quite despair and sorrow of losing such an amazing person. And I remember I played this once, I was playing this one song, just trying to get through it, and the words just hit me, and I just literally fell down and cried, you know, like thinking of him, like, and I was like, you know, I'm DJing at DC 10, and like all these people, everyone's like having a good time, and I just had this moment of just like, complete sorrow, you know, and I'm just like, fuck, I like, I was like, you know, and then like trying to, you know, like, you know, get back up and, and continue. But that goes back to the great power of these records and these moments and experiencing our emotions, I think as DJs through playing music for people, you know, it's, it's, it's insane really to have that time, you know, because People think it's great being a DJ, but we're also human beings that have emotions and who are going through times, and sometimes times of great beauty and sometimes times of great sorrow. And the music we play is, reflects that, you know, and I think it reflects that not only the environment we're in and maybe their sorrows or happiness, but um, just kind of the, the world that we're living in today and trying to transform that world and just create a soundscape to, to our times, I think, truly. I think another thing that, that sometimes it's important to get across about DJing is how you, well, probably two things. One of which is that the lifestyle can be really unhealthy. Yeah, we're speaking about this later. Which, the um, you know, we might talk about. But also, the other thing is that you have to really, um, you have to look after your career in a sense of knowing who you are and where you want to go. And... Um, you know, what, what, one of the things that I decided with the was, writing was, was, yeah, was that what I wanted was longevity, um, and and it, I wanted to keep, I, I want to keep DJing forever, but I but I know, you know, that if I'm DJ four times a week, or if I de if I DJ say too much in Manchester, yeah. people are going to stop going. Either I'm going to stop enjoying it, or people are going to stop going. Like, you know, if I play Manchester, 700 people will queue up and come and hear me play. And I probably, you know, say I've got 25 more gigs left in me in Manchester. Well, I'd rather do them over the space of 10 years than the space of six months. Yeah. So I only play maximum three times a year in Manchester. Yeah. So less is more, because I want that longevity, you know what I mean? And, and, and I think that... You know, again, when you're young, you don't think that. When I was at the Hacienda, I was like, give me gigs, give me gigs, give me gigs. Give me whatever, to be honest. <laughs> but then, eventually, you're like, mm, hang on a minute. Um, it's quite funny you say that, because I've actually hit that point 
in my life right now, um, like at some point you start to think about life a bit more and a bit more than like you're like, okay, I'm doing this, this is, okay, it's going, this is cool. But how do I want to remember this experience? You know, and how do I want people to remember me? And what do I want to be known for? And I think it's, like you said, great. We had some cool talks in the back speaking about this, about the lifestyle that we all choose to live, you know, which is in incredibly, we're an incredibly blessed life, you know, in, in many ways. And so many people here to be really turned on, you know, and be in this segment of society that's part of society, but it's quite, that's also quite progressive you know, with its ideals on morality, with politics, with anything, you know? And, um, and I started to realize, looking at my peers and, and other things, and I was like, well, I, and even last year I started to not enjoy DJing as much. Like, I, I loved it, but it was just becoming quite, quite hard, you know, just because I was like, what's happening with my life? And at some point, it, you have to become very aware with what's gonna happen next, you know? and like how you want to be known. Like, so for me, I feel like my position in electronic music um, is gonna be the person who preserves the past, you know? Like, I, I, I'm also an innovator, but at some point, you know, I was greatly beneficial, uh, not beneficial, I was like, um, I don't know the word. God, I'm sorry, long weekend. DC 10 was on Monday. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. No, but uh, I, I, it, was, it was amazing that I had the ability to be able to be here speaking with Dave or to be, be with Al, friends with Ali and, you know, so many other people who have created this culture, like, literally from the beginning. Like, it's like almost like being around when Robert Johnson was playing blues, you know, and you're like the next generation. And by buying Dave's records, it's a way for me to continue one day telling that story, you know, and a story that I think really needs to be told and trying to keep that idea and keep the idea that this music and real music is important, you know, to the next generation. Because kids coming today, I feel like they, they're getting more and more turned on, but we have to realize that music's not disposable and this is something forever and it's something to believe in. And also, I think we, we have to know that, again, this is something that our society doesn't like us to think about, but is that history is important. I'm not talking about retro. I'm not interested in retro, and I know you're not, you know, and, and unfortunately, Manchester sometimes falls into a massive retro hole with, um, you know, endless classics nights, which I won't go near. Uh, I get people on the guest list for them, but I won't play at them. Um, <laughs> But um, history is important to understand, and I mean this in a kind of political way as well. You know, I'm, I mean, we live in such an instant culture. We live in, in the now, we live in breaking news 24, where everything happens now and we have to react now, and our sense of perspective is 10 seconds. Whereas I think that we would all learn a lot by knowing history more. And we, we would know what the process of history is. How did we get where we are? And I mean that in terms of how did electronic dance music get to where it is. If you know that, it enriches everything. Yeah, no. And it helps the future. And I mean politically, if we knew where we all come from in terms of people, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of power structures, in terms of all the struggles that people had for the vote, for equality, if we knew all that, it would help us so much in the now and the future, instead of just always reacting to the latest sensationalized soundbite. Yeah, uh, it, that's, that's such a deep thought. I mean, especially when coming to politics and everything, I feel like as people, as DJs, we have the great ability to travel the world, you know, which has opened your mind to so many different things and cultures and people. And it's like, what I find is when there are, um, uh, diversities to people or kind of racisms or hate or prejudice I think is the, the best word to say it's out of a sense of not knowing other cultures you know like so if you don't know something about something else it's easy to fear it or to slag it off or just be like fuck it you know like I, I know oh, they're not but like the same is with musical heritage you know I think I am in the place I am today I am 100% in the place I am today because I've invested so much time in learning about music, 
you know, and playing music, and like literally, like daily, like and finding new things and influencing not only the music that I make, but the music I play. Because by knowing the past, you can really start to like put a point on the future, you know? Like sometimes, you know, we'll be playing with some like young kids and stuff, and it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's, you know, like you play out like a really common old record, and they're like, what are you talking about? It's like, come on, man, you know? <laughs> Okay, you don't, I don't you have like no way back, basically. <laughs> like you've never heard this before, and it's like, you know, you're like 25. You know, you should be in the game at this point. And it's it's just it's history and knowledge is something that we should continually search for. And and I'm so grateful that Dave's given me the opportunity to continue that search for my own personal knowledge. So you haven't opened every one of the 37 boxes of Rencore? No, I've you? opened like five. <laughs> <laughs> like I've actually gone through three, and then I, uh, we, we, we put some other ones, like uh, I shipped over like half the boxes, and then we put some in like, um, I've got like a big Ikea thing, so I put some in there. And it's just like, it's just such a labor of love, and it's a labor of your love, that it's something I haven't really taken, I, I, I want to get into when I had time. That was part of bringing the collection here to Ibiza, because I have a summer here to hang out in my house and, and get geeky. Actually, me and the bros were talking about it the other day. We're uh, hiring their, their tour manager to sit around and encode records. But it's, it's incredible, the, the records I found in this guy's collection. Like, I was going through, I don't know if you guys are, are tribal America, or <laughs> like, our tribal records. Seriously, like, I go, to, I go to record stores a day, like, hoping to find one or two, like, a great white label of Deep Disc Dream. And I was like, sick, with, like, the insert reaction seat, you know? I, like, I kept all the insert reactions. <laughs> yeah, I love, that's my favorite part, <laughs> the insert <laughs> sheets. And I'm, like, I'm like, this is, because I remember working at a record store. The that, press releases. Yeah, yeah, the press release stuff. And it's, like, for me, it's so incredible, like, because, you know, at all points of time, there's like everyone has these, you know, everyone's like, oh, it used to be better, or da 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 da, you know, and you're like, you're like, oh, you know, I, I wasn't really there. And every time has a great period of time, you know, and everything was great in its own way, you know, like he's talking about the Hacienda and these other places, you know, where today it's like, wow, I wish you could have been there. And it's like, you know, there's 200 people, and like, you know, or like certain ratio, like they were an opening band, and there'd be no one in the club, and like these guys playing in you know, funny suits being like, and now they're like this cult seminal band, you know? So we should never like look back and think better or worse, but just having that knowledge of looking back is, is hugely important. Are you gonna play a certain ratio? Yeah, we can play a certain ratio right now. Flight, right? You see, <laughs> Seth Trox is taking requests from me. So. <laughs> Right now, live I actually, actually, in a beta. I, the biggest request is just to keep You don't know what speed this record goes at though, do you? Uh, I'm really hoping you play it at the wrong speed. It would show your human. You have to put the needle on the record. <laughs> I think it's a 33. <laughs> Wrong speed, Seth Troxler. <laughs>
We haven't got much time, so I'm gonna wow. just fade it, fade it out there a little bit. But uh, earlier we were talking about, you, you were saying um, that it's about the richness of the music. I mean, you listen to that record, and how beautiful was that? Like, just so abstract, so much art. Like, it's just the sonically sounds interesting, you know? And interesting music will always survive. And, uh, it, I mean, also, the space in it. Yeah. That's like, that's just like the, the most important thing about a record is the space. Yeah, it's funny. You know like, I mean, people are like, oh, put more notes no, in. Take them take out. out. It doesn't that's have to be like, over-interesting. That's why I like, I like Jamie XX's work. You can see he just edits out sound until you're just left with space and amazing that's basically. So, that's so it's so important actually even like when i'm producing music i try to not put in a clap if, if possible you know it's like there's so much space or like uh what i often do like i play music quite fast actually like w what today is quite fast like maybe like 120 128 beat per minute per beats per minute but the records i choose to play are quite sparse so even though tempo wise it may be quite fast, but the actual vibe is like kind of slow still, you know? And it's, it's almost an optical illusion of sound and you know, with spacing or minimalism or anything, if you can space sound in the right way, then it gives you more room and an audio frequency level to actually have space, which is incredible. I think the other, th the other thing that I love about that record, um, well obviously it's all live instruments, they're all, it's all real, not that I've got any problem with unreal instruments, but it's how it's weird. You know, it's like you, 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 wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have been in the studio and come out of there thinking, fuck, that's going to sell a million. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't come out of, of the studio thinking that's going to knock Bruce Springsteen off the front of the New Musical Express. <laughs> you know, it's in a different world. You're just doing that for yourself. And actually, the weirdness is an important part, even the uncommerciality of it. And yeah. the otherworldliness of it is an important part of, of that music. 100%, 100%. I mean, as an artist myself, I've always kind of never thought about being commercial or commerciality. And it's, it's through that, I think, idea that you find today's greatest and largest artist, yeah. you know? And because the best if they'd artist. sat down and thought, let's make a commercial record, they'd, Over. Have, they'd, have, they'd have made a, a record like Wham! or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. You're like some guy who went to Full Sail or SAE yeah. who now makes records for Carrie Perry. You know, that's not like a real kind of like musician or someone speaking here at IMS. You're just kind of like a laggy, you know? And it's like music and ideas aren't created by numbers or created by formulas. They're created by people and spaces and, and like really just being influenced by general moments in time. There you go. Oh, yeah. oh. Well, w w we're over time, <laughs> but what I said to you before, Seth, is that I'm quite happy to talk for three hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, what I would just like to, what, that initial thing of me thinking, what would Seth, Maybe I should take a few things out because Seth isn't going to get into all these. What's been amazing, and, and seriously, because we haven't really had a conversation about it since the transaction, is um, how you have, you know, you've really dived in. And actually, the things, some of the things that I thought you might not like are the things that have turned you on the most, which is, <laughs> if, if, if that is what you're into in the collection, when you open the other 30 boxes, <laughs> your head is gonna explode. Yeah, this is, this is actually, it's funny enough, like people often ask me what music do I listen to, you know, and I, I buy so many house and techno records, but I'm a music collector, and specifically music from 73 to about 84, 85, you know? Like it's, it's a period that I wasn't al alive. <laughs> Like I didn't, I was not even a thought. I mean, my dad probably wasn't even jerking off in 73, you know? But at the, at the end of the day, like, it's like, there are these time periods that somehow reflect to you emotionally so, so deep. And I found that music in these records. And I'm so thankful for Dave to have uh, let me, given me the opportunity to pass that down. Like, it's, it's, it's really, truly incredible. And I'm grateful that IMS has given us the chance to meet up and talk about these. Fantastic. Very good. Thank you guys so much. All right, thank you. Thank you.